You're listening to episode 69 of Paz de Chipotle. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food history writer, cook, and author. And on this podcast, I explore the gastronomic traditions of Mexico and bring together the voices of cooks, authors, and entrepreneurs who build cross-cultural bridges around the world, championing Mexican food. You can find more information about my podcasts, publications, and subscribe to my newsletter on my website, pasthechipotle.com, or simply find and click the link on this episode's notes. I am sure that many of you have had fermented drinks more than once in your life. Maybe even you have them on a regular basis. But have you had alcoholic fermented drinks? Well, if you're on a quest to try some of them, then Mexico is your destination. Because we have over 60 traditional fermented alcoholic drinks. And actually, a significant number of them date back to the pre-Columbian period. They are made using fruits, bulks, pulp of fruits, sap, seeds, and stems of different plants. And today, we continue with the fourth installment of the ongoing series called Cultural Staples. We started a few months ago with chocolate, two episodes, then we continued with chiles and beans. And now we turn our attention to the ancient drink of the gods, pillar of rituals, king of celebrations, and ultimate cornerstone of the regional culinary identity of central Mexico. That's right, today is all about pulque. This episode covers crucial aspects about the cultural history of pulque, its uses in the ancient pre-Columbian world, botanical aspects, and world fame that even attracted the unflattering attention of none other than the Führer, who was seriously intrigued by the powers of this mythic elixir of life. Mm, curious now? Well, we will explore how pulque went from sacred to common, from ritualistic to cultural curiosity, and from stigmatized to a fashionable and chic drink. In preparation for this episode, I used a whole lot of documents and scholarly papers, mostly in Spanish, but a few in English. And if you want to know more about them, I have left a list on the special blog post of this episode, including some additional audio and video materials that you will listen today. So you can check it out by clicking the link on this episode's notes that you will find on your podcast app. Those who are subscribed to my newsletter, which I always try to keep sweet and simple, mm, we don't like spamming here, they have also received a taste of this episode and even got some yummy pulque recipes. So if you haven't subscribed yet, find the link to do so on the notes of this episode and stay in touch with me by following me over Instagram and Twitter. I love it when you guys reach out to say hola and share your thoughts about the things I talk about over the show. Well, I think we are more than ready to get started, so let's get on with this boozy show. I hope you enjoy this episode. Lo más natural que ustedes puedan tomar, y es algo increíble, que una planta como esta produzca este tipo de líquido, y es muy nutritivo. This is Don Herminio, whom I have visited many times in his hometown of San Mateo Osolco, which overviews the wonderful fertile valleys framed by the majestic Popocatépetl volcano in Puebla. He comes from a proud family of farmers who grow heritage blue corn and agave pulquero. 
And as he was extracting some aguamiel in this occasion, or sap, of this agave plant, he was sharing with me how he never ceases to be surprised by the qualities of the sap of this prodigious plant. The fact that pulque is one of the best known traditional fermented drinks from Mexico is due to many factors, including that the region where it is largely produced, that is, um, the central high plains of Mexico, happen to be also the epicenter of the political and cultural influence of the late Mexica or Aztec Empire. More than 500 years after the disappearance of this empire due to the Spanish conquest, the vast cultural legacy of this and that of the other 60 plus native tribes is very prevalent as their traditions constitute the core of many practices that still survive to this day, including the production and consumption of pulque. So, what is pulque? Let's begin with the basics. Pulque is a unique fermented drink made from freshly harvested sap from a giant variety of agave or maguey. Its appearance, in case you've never seen it, is that of a hmm, sort of a giant flower. The strong and long leaves have an opaque and green color, similar to the shade of moss or sage. The edge of the elongated leaves are crowned with a row of dark spines, and they end in a very sharp and hard needle of about 10 centimeters long. Indeed, the ancestral agricultural region where agave pulquero grows is the high plains of south-central Mexico, namely the states of Mexico, Puebla, Hidalgo and Tlaxcala. And one very important aspect that makes the cultivation of giant agaves or magueyes is that this area has a very unique terroir with a cold and semi-dry climate together with a heavily enriched soil thanks to the thousands of years of eruptions and activity of the transvolcanic belt. All of this provides the ideal growing conditions for magueyes to develop, grow and ultimately produce between 500 and 1,000 liters of sweet, delicious sap known as aguamiel or honey water that is extracted when the plant reaches its prime. It is important to say, however, that a minor and much scattered production of agave pulquero also takes place in some towns in the states of Oaxaca, Querétaro, San Luis Potosí, Hidalgo, and even Jalisco and Veracruz. But the main difference is that these other areas didn't quite develop the same culinary, medicinal, and ritualistic practices as complex and prevalent as those from central Mexico. Now, Let's take a look at some aspects about the botany and cultivation of this wonderful plant. The knowledge associated with pulque production involves a deep understanding of the botanical aspects of the seven varieties of agave pulquero. Its agricultural cycle that can extend for up to 10 years waiting for them to ripen. That also includes the knowledge of the methods of sap extraction and fermentation. Unlike the production of spirits and other processed alcoholic drinks, the simple yet precise skills required to produce pulque are only ever transmitted from generation to generation within a very tightly knitted farming community. Because there are no schools or training centers to become an agave farmer, nor formal studies to train to become a sap extractor or tlachiquero. These are the main social factors that, in one way, have kept the process of pulque production alive and unaltered. And on the other hand, the fact that it depends on family dynamics, regional economies, consumption patterns, and even variations in the weather puts this tradition under continuous stress. So, 
The fact alone that this practice has been kept alive mainly by oral and practical transmission for at least 25 centuries and is still going is a remarkable cultural achievement. The most common varieties of giant agave pulquero are manso, verde, ayoteco, carrizo, and pua larga. Each plant can produce in its lifetime a total of 50 seedlings, or mecuates, which are carefully removed and planted with a distance between them of approximately 5 meters. A row of agave pulquero is called metepantle, which literally means agave wool. Now, let me describe the actual process of extraction of sap or aguamiel. When a maguey or agave has reached its maturity, but right before its inflorescence grows, the lachiqueros remove the leaves from the very top of the plant with the aid of a machete and carve a round hole on top of the heart of the plant, which resembles kind of the shape of a very, very big pineapple, except this one is hollow inside. Then, using special scrapers and blades, carefully they make cuts or incisions inside the wall of the heart of the plant. This has a purpose to encourage the sap to flow inside. And then they fold a few of the thick leaves that are on top of the plant to cover the hole and place a very heavy stone to prevent insects and dust to fall inside. In a matter of hours, there will be enough sap for them to retrieve. And with the help of an elongated calabash called a cocote, that has two tiny holes on each extreme. They use this tool to create a siphon effect. So by sucking up the air inside of the acocote, the sap flows into the calabash, which is then carefully removed out of the heart of the plant, and the sap is poured in a container. This extraction process has to be done twice a day, and depending on the size and health of each agave, it will take between four to six months to completely drain the sap, which, again, has a total volume of between 500 and 1,000 liters of sap. Now, it is very important here to emphasize the fact that during this period, the plant itself is alive, and once all of the sap has been extracted from it, it simply dies. The carcass is removed to make way for another metepantle or agave seedling to take its place. And often, the dead agave is used for fuel. Magueyes have multiple uses, apart from being a source of this precious sap. Some are farmed for their leaves, which are used for the preparation of dishes like barbacoa, the skin of the leaves is also used for a culinary technique called misiote, which consists of making parcels of meat and vegetables that are steamed and served often with a drunken salsa made with pulque. The strong fibers of the leaves are used in the making of bags, sacks, ropes and brushes. And in ancient times, the thick, strong spines at the tip of the leaves were used as needles and also as ritualistic tools used in practices of self-inflicted wounds in order to draw a small amount of blood. So once the sap is extracted, it only needs less than an hour to begin a slow and steady fermentation process that is best controlled when the sap is kept in a cool and well-aired space known as Tinacal. When the agua miel or sap is extracted, it has a clear honey-like color and a smoky and deep herbal smell and taste. It is sweet and cool as the thick agave leaves and the heart itself of the plant keep it fresh. As it ferments, the color changes from amber cloudy to white and opaque, and the texture becomes denser. So the longer it ferments, the denser the texture will be. And that is slightly similar to that of a watery kefir yogurt. Pulque has only between 4 and 8% of alcoholic content, which means you really need to consume 
large amounts to get proper and truly drunk. Pulque is commonly consumed on its own or natural, but is often mixed with the fresh pulp of fruits, ground nuts, and even oatmeal to produce sweet and incredibly refreshing drinks called curados or cured pulque. And as it is the case with other fermented drinks, the taste of natural pulque is slightly tangy, but when mixed with fruits and sweetened, it is no different from a very palatable yogurt smoothie. Now let's take a look at the different uses of pulque in ancient Mexico. You see, intoxicants and alcoholic drinks had a huge cultural and ritualistic importance as they were substances that facilitated encounters with the mystical world. The rules, uses and social practices around their consumption gave the opportunity for creating meanings, symbolisms and metaphors. So, the ritualistic and religious relevance of fermented alcoholic drinks was as important as their use in everyday life, from their culinary or medicinal qualities to the recreational and joyous aspect of their consumption. The fact that pulque is obtained by the fermentation of sap from an actual living plant gave this substance the quality of literally being alive in every sense of the word. Known as octli or nikutli in the Nahuatl-speaking world, this drink had a number of cultural and economic functions that went way beyond ritualistic drunkenness. And something interesting has happened over the last 50 or so years because our knowledge and understanding of the culture, practices and life of pre-Columbian Mexico have changed enormously. In part, thanks to the many research works that combine techniques and disciplines from ethnohistory, archaeology, archaeobotany and the study of codices themselves that have together built a more comprehensive picture that has really debunked myths and misrepresentations of ancient traditions, because most of our early knowledge about them initially came from texts by conquistadors and adventurers who lacked the knowledge, skills, and in many cases, interest in studying and faithfully portraying these complex civilizations. While pulque was considered a sacred drink and its use and abuse outside specific rituals and contexts was sanctioned, we know now that it was indeed a very important part of the daily diet of some regions and, of course, the social life of many tribes. However, its consumption remained regulated and it never completely lost its ritualistic qualities, which differentiated pulque from other everyday drinks. The consumption as a dietary supplement was especially important among the vulnerable and elderly population and was prescribed for a number of medical treatments, as it is documented in the amazing book Libellus Medicinalibus Indorum Herbis, also known as, and this is an easier name, the De La Cruz Badiano Codex, the best and most complete source of ancient medicine in Mexico. It presents remedies that go from pulque balms to treat skin rashes, pulque seasoned with salt or mixed with prickled pear pulp to encourage the healthy production of breast milk. And it was also prescribed as a standard treatment for intestinal parasites, swelling and other stomach problems. In fact, speaking of digestive problems and fair warning, sorry if you're eating, you might want to pause this for a bit. Okay. The use of medicinal pulque enemas was a common practice in the pre-Columbian world and was particularly popular to treat hemorrhoids, diarrheas and many other stomach and intestinal problems. Now, this is where things get interesting because there were also recreational and ritualistic enemas prepared with alcoholic 
or and hallucinogenic substances. And there are many surviving objects from the Mayan classic period from around the 7th century that indicates that these objects were used for the application of these enemas. I mean, it might sound strange or even... <laughs> slightly cringe-worthy. But in ancient Rome and Greece, there were many similar practices. In fact, we know that in Egypt, there was a specific person appointed as the guardian of the pharaoh's anus. <laughs> so, ancient Michigan tribes were by no means an exception when it came to these matters. What we know for a fact is that pulque is very rich in vitamins and when it is at its prime of fermentation, it develops proteins, enzymes and increases the body's ability to absorb vitamin B, C, iron and antioxidants. Precisely because the fermentation of glucose and sucrose contained in the sap, these are kept alive in the form of erythrol. Its nutritional contents continue fermenting without dying even after its consumption, resulting in an amazing biochemical process that feeds the bacteria in our digestive system. Think of it as a very far superior drink compared to Iran, Yakult, Kefir or Kombucha, with the added bonus of being alcoholic. <laughs> And this is a perfect time for me to plug an episode I made over my other podcast, Hungry Books, in which I review a book called A Short History of Drunkness, How, Why, Where and When Humankind Has Gotten Merry from the Stone Age to the Present by Mark Forsyth. It is a super entertaining and informative book and also quite a fun episode to listen to. So you can find the link to check it out on this episode's notes. Now, I have already told you that this drink of ancient origins is very much alive to this day, but its history wasn't as linear or smooth as you might think. And I'm sure you can all figure that the most complex first hurdle it had to go through was indeed the Spanish conquest, which was a complex and long-lasting event that impacted every aspect of life in the New World specifically in Mexico, the once commanding presence of dozens of indigenous tribes with different languages, social systems and complex cosmovisions became a pale shadow of their glory as natives were attacked, persecuted, enslaved, displaced and subject to a colonial regime with all that it implies. They were placed lowest in the social stratification of the casta system, with Spaniards at the top, of course. The practices, ways of life, traditions, diets and beliefs were transformed by the forced adoption of European slash Spanish values, religion, social order, economy, agriculture and overall way of life. And of course, traditional foodways were and have always been subject to different forms of interpretations and narratives and often used to describe the taste and identity of specific groups. We will see more about this ahead. So, in the case of Mexico, foods and drinks whose origins are rooted in indigenous practices were used to define the costumes of mixed race groups. For example, one smallest were transformed into hyper-enriched dishes that brought together particularly expensive and meaningful ingredients that showed the wealth and status of a family. They were no longer associated with indigenous people, but with the mestizo middle and upper classes. Chocolate was once a sacred drink among the Maya, Olmec, Mexica and many other tribes and it became the definitive luxurious drink for affluent Spaniards who mixed it with milk from European cows, sweetened it with the sugar from newly created sugarcane plantations and was seasoned with the spices brought from the Far East and Asia. Other fruits and drinks didn't have the same fate or treatment, but somehow they manage to survive to our days. And that is very much the case of pulque. In the colonial regime, 
agricultural states or haciendas were organized by a system called encomiendas, which was a sort of commercial license granted by the viceregal government. And these places were the powerhouse of the economy and the backbone of the new social order, in which many practices, including the production and consumption of pulque, were radically transformed. Perhaps the most significant change was the secularization of this drink. After all, Spaniards came from a culture that anthropologists define as wet, meaning that the consumption of alcohol was part of everyday life. Ale and wine were widely consumed since medieval times, and it was a much healthier alternative to contaminated water. And while there was an increased consumption of alcohol to mark particularly significant moments, they were no strangers to the regular consumption of alcohol. However, pre-Columbian tribes were largely dry cultures, in which a measured consumption of alcohol was allowed under somehow restrictive conditions, and public abundant consumption and drunkenness was openly accepted and encouraged only for very specific ritualistic occasions. And that's why Spaniards came to see pulque as yet another drink to add to their diet, and saw a very good opportunity to exploit its production for a very profitable commercial gain. And for the first time ever, the colonial period saw the creation of pulquerías, or pulque bars, where this drink was made available for a price and allowed people to consume it for their personal enjoyment and not for religious, ceremonial or medicinal purpose. So this required the creation of a very organized pulque economy to secure a large-scale commercial operation. And so, from the 17th century to the mid-19th century, pulque, producing rural states, or haciendas pulqueras, saw the rise of a new class of rural gentry. Now, the main consumers of pulque in urban centers were indigenous people and the lower segment of the mestizo and mixed heritage population. The race-obsessed colonial society saw in every aspect of life an opportunity to differentiate each group. And unlike chocolate's rise to the upper classes, pulque remained identified with the tastes and practices of quote-unquote poor and indigenous people. And thus, centuries of cultural prejudice and stereotypes were the defining aspects of the social history of this drink. We really don't have many recollections of contemporaneous accounts about pulque between the late 1500s and the 1700s, and it wouldn't be until the last decades of the 1800s that we have an abundance of material about it. This period was marked by the social effervescence that led to the independence of Mexico from Spain, which also coincided with the boom of printed press and a period in which religion stopped being the central aspect of artistic expressions. And so, literature, poetry, theater, music, and even painting allowed artists and creators to express their own views and channel popular culture and everyday life. Food also saw profound transformations. The publications of the first Mexican cookbooks were far different from those that we are used to see in modern bookshops. They were compilations of recipes, etiquette, domestic economy, and other useful information to allow the aspiring middle classes to elevate their tastes and diets to mirror those of France, Spain, and other European nations. But interestingly, a new and very manicured idea of nationhood began taking shape, and the effort to define a recognizable Mexican cuisine or Mexican style slowly gained momentum. There has been extensive research about the portrayal of food in literature and painting, usually using ingredients and practices to associate the characters or groups to a specific class, and pulquerías remained the space where not only pulque drinking but other social practices of conviviality and sociability of men and women took place, which were usually looked down by the middle and upper classes who chose other spaces and consumed 
different drinks as social markers of distinction and status. This, again, also coincided with the industrialization of Mexico that became an economic and political priority for the 31 years long tenure of President Porfirio Diaz, who welcomed large foreign investments to develop transport, rail networks, modern mining, and also facilitated the arrival of beer and cider breweries that transformed the agricultural system as well as the drinking cultures of Mexico in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Sadly, as it is often the case, the strategy to position these new drinks, particularly beer, was through a campaign of discredit and discrimination towards competing traditional drinks and the people who consumed them, followed by the notion that any drink that was not deemed as modern, scientifically produced, and above all, that just didn't align with the cultural canon of Europe, was not acceptable, desirable, or safe. The consumption of pulque declined sharply prior to the rise of the Mexican Revolution in 1910, which was caused by historical agrarian conflicts that saw the emergence of large-scale mobilizations of peasants and farmers who had been systematically abused and exploited for centuries. The aftermath of the revolution was very much evident as far as the 1940s, when the agrarian conflicts re-emerged and the production and consumption of pulque was at its lowest point and remained at the verge of disappearing for the next following 70 years. Now, in modern times, for the last 15 or so years, there has been an increased interest in the cultural history, botany and health studies around pulque. This has also been accompanied by key transformations in the way the middle classes have adopted pulque consumption as a newly resignified practice that swings between hip gentrification and folklorization of traditions and places and a quest to reshape regional culinary identities and and all of this adds new ideas about nationhood. And I will talk more about this revival of pulque, but I will make a little pause here and we we'll resume after a short break. As you know, Pasa Chipotle podcast complements my editorial work through my ebooks Mexican Street Food, Mexican Chocolate, Mexican Fiestas, and Mexican Market Food, in which I explore in depth the gastronomic traditions, cultural history, and of course, present world acclaimed recipes from Mexico. And I hope to very soon resume delivering my food tours in my beloved city of Puebla. All of my ebooks are researched, written, and photographed by me. And by supporting my work, you are indeed showing your appreciation for independent creators like myself who bring empowerment, creativity, passion, and diversity to find new ways to discover and enjoy Mexico's gastronomic heritage. To read more about my ebooks, you can go to my website, pasachipotle.com, or click the link on this episode's description. Go to pasachipotle.com and get ready to cook, learn, and enjoy Mexican food like you've never imagined. Now, I want to explore some aspects of the mysticism around pulque throughout time. It is really no exaggeration to say that the research about the many symbolisms associated to pulque, as well as its ritualistic uses, is far from finished. And the fact that so many indigenous cultures developed practices and specific traditions that have somehow survived to our days gives us a staggering amount of information to keep us busy for hundreds of years to come. And that's how we know that one of the mythologized origin stories of Pulque tells the tale of a goddess by the name of Mayahuel, 
who, like most female deities of the Mexica Pantheon, is associated to fertility and nourishment. And it is mentioned across different codices, like the Rios Borbonicus, Maglia Becchiano, and Borgia. She is often depicted either sitting or holding an agave plant, which means that she really is associated with the plant itself rather than the fermented drink. But it's this relationship that gives the plant and the sap a divine origin. It is particularly important to underline the fact that pulque was valued because it was and it is a living substance. And the fermentation process was seen as an enhancer of the life-giving properties of an already sacred plant. And as such, it was a perfect drink to perform ritualistic and ceremonial practices. Ancient and even mixed heritage rituals that involve offers of foods and drinks are framed within a logic of reciprocity, in which people are indeed returning the blessings in the form of food and life to the deities that provide such gifts to mankind. And this is a recurring theme in all these traditions. So by consuming large quantities of pulque, it was also a way to honor and pay their respects to the ruling deities of nature. Let's expand on this. Drinking alcoholic drinks and pulque had a whole range of meanings, including one that I find particularly fascinating, which is the symbolism of religious drunkenness among many tribes that represented a proverbial death and resurrection. So drinking themselves to oblivion during special ceremonies was aimed to create a symbolic sacrifice of offering one's life to the deities, passing out and experiencing that very painful state of intoxication followed by unconsciousness to then eventually come out of it the next day with a horrible hangover was the ultimate metaphor of rebirth, of dying for one's gods. And by the grace of this mystical drink, they were able to walk in and out between the world of the living and the spiritual realm. As you can tell, there is very little about the rich cultural history of pulque that accompanies the now fashionable consumption and media coverage of this drink. In one way, it shouldn't surprise us because, well, we live in a mostly shallow and low-context consumerist culture. But indeed, pulque's rise to fame is really not that new. And proof of that is a recent mind-blowing discovery that will take us to Nazi Germany. So last year, Javier Gomez Marin, an absolute authority on pulque studies from my hometown of Puebla, made an incredible discovery about the uncanny connection between Hitler and pulque. Hold on to your shoelaces. The story goes like this. Behind the fast rise of Hitler's to power, there were key people that shaped the image, narrative and Nazi ideology And I know you are familiar with the Minister of Propaganda, Paul Joseph Goebbels. But there were also many other characters that worked backstage. One of them was film producer, director and screenwriter Hubert Schonge, who, among many other things, he was commissioned by Hitler himself to produce documentaries around the world about people, places and things he saw as potentially beneficial to his project. Heavens knows how uh, news about pulque reached Hitler, but he learned that in Mexico there was an ancient drink with qualities so unique that made it sound like the next best thing to the fountain of youth. So obviously Hitler must have been intrigued by this elixir of life. After all, we know that he was pretty obsessed about engineering and enhancing a super race. And this mysterious substance certainly did more than each his curiosity. So off he sent Schonge to Mexico to obtain information about it. It was the year of 1936, and then Mexico had its own many problems. And while there was a strong European and certainly German presence in the country, those were really remnants of the large investments made in the early 1900s. So maybe one German man filming indigenous people in remote towns didn't worry anyone. I mean... Why would it? Sean Gur came and went, and no one that we know of took notice or interest in what he did. Soon after, the war erupted in 1939, and the world was pretty busy following the events until its dramatic end in 1945. 
Fast forward 70 years, our man, Javier Gomez Marín, receives a call from Germany. A friend informs him that at a public auction in Berlin, one of the listed items is a film called Pulque Beritung in Mexico, or the production of Pulque in Mexico. Javier tells his friend to get it, no matter the cost. And as it is suspected, no one bats an eyelash and the only bid is hers. 40 scruffy dollars was the final price for that long-lost film that made its way back to Mexico. This is a silent 16mm film that is only about 12 minutes long. And in the scenes, we can see Tlachiqueros extracting sap, someone pouring pulque to a group of indigenous men who drink it from makeshift bowls made out of agave leaves. We see the same Tlachiquero covering the whole of the agave after extracting sap, and he fastens some barrels of sap to a donkey and moves along to another agave. Obviously, as a historical document, this is an incredibly valuable piece. And I guess Sean Goh was lucky that Hitler wasn't a film critic and that he was otherwise busy in the build-up of the war because I'm sure he paid him good money to travel half the world to make a documentary that tells us well, nothing about the qualities of this wonderfully powerful drink. Actually, not only Sean Goh survived the war and outlived Hitler, he went on to have a successful career as a filmmaker and died in 1978. Freaking Nazis, huh? This film has not yet been officially premiered, at least not to my knowledge. But Gomez Marin has offered many interviews discussing uh, this little movie. In the blog post of this episode, you will find this film and also other links to some interviews and articles about this. Now, to close down this episode, I want to make some reflections about the resurgence of pulque. There has definitely been a revival of pulque in the past years, and it went from near extinction to becoming a staple curiosity near touristic attractions, and it is now a key item in the menu of gastropubs and trendy restaurants that are a part of the so-called gourmet New Mexican cuisine movement. But those that really contribute to the appreciation and value of the traditional production chain behind it. And, of course, the people who make it possible. Or is it just a new form of appropriation and class-based form of distinction and a sanitized version of traditional practices? <laughs> well, I think you know where I lean towards, but it's not quite a black and white scenario. So first, let's say that even in the colonial period, the consumption of pulque was very different in urban centers than what occurred in rural communities. And while mainstream research works describe urban pulquerias as the social ecosystem where pulque is consumed, that is only true for such urban cases. Because the reality is that in the communities of pulque producing microregions, they still maintain the ritualistic celebrations and consumption of pulque as a central part of their religious and agricultural practices. For instance, in the town of San Mateo Osolco, near the Popocatépetl volcano in Puebla, there is an annual celebration of the Pulque Festival, in which ceremonies, dances, competitions among producers and local traditional cooks take place, and they are at the center of this festivity. Yes, they have opened up to the public that flocks to this charming little village to drink, eat and witness these practices also, the world-famous town of Cholula proudly maintains its famous Tlahuanca celebration, which is an ancient ceremony of drunkenness that only occurs thanks to a very complex system of organization and indigenous and Catholic practices that work together in blessings, exchange of gifts, prayers, dances and communal feasts and, of course, drinking. While visitors are welcome to attend and be part of some rituals, the purpose and structure of the Tlahuanca has really not been altered or perverted for any commercial purposes. In urban contexts, the revival of pulque has had a very different transformation process. First, the decline of pulquerias reinforced the already existing prejudice about them as dirty dens where low life gathered to consume a drink that was for centuries used as part of the discourses of racism, colonialism, and class divide. 
Yet somehow these places made it well into the 21st century. And that's when Gen Xers, yours truly included, discovered these gems that were full of potential and wonderful history. We don't need to talk dates, but let's say that I was doing my first postgrad when I went for the first time to a pulqueria in Mexico City. My classmates and I were curious and terribly excited, as we were tired of not really having spaces to socialize and enjoy a drink that didn't imply going to bars or cantinas, always seen as places for old people, or having to go to an actual restaurant and having to order food to be able to buy overpriced drinks. So a pulqueria seemed a very good alternative. Not only the clientele was not bothered about our presence, they even seemed curious and amused as we ordered more than we could possibly drink in one single sitting. We kept the jukebox busy and danced until we were really, really dizzy. It was exhilarating. And as full-time students, we were perpetually overworked and chronically broke. So the odd trip to a pulqueria became an important part of our limited social life. Fast forward 10 years or so, and the boom of cultural and gastro-tourism coincided with the renewed efforts of the Mexican state to leverage and use the full force of cultural policies to sell Mexico as a destination where history, modernity and tradition met. And that of course came hand in hand with the gentrification, the rise of a middle class that was whiter in taste and yet so in the quote-unquote borrowing of traditional clothes, foods and music, a great way to create new representations of what it means to be Mexican in a global context. You might not know this, but here in Mexico we have even coined terms to describe these type of people as white sicans or tuluminatis <laughs> to, well, call these new tribes. But going back to Pulque's new life, I really do celebrate the fact that the consumption has risen because that means a much needed economic benefit for producers. And I'm also fascinated by the creativity of the new Pulque mixology and the rise of amazing drinks and cocktails that celebrate this product and give it a brand new life. But I am also aware that these gastronomic proposals are created and offered by restaurants that will never be affordable to most Mexicans. And I'm not sure that producers are made aware of what goes on after they deliver the product and walk away. Many of these places also cater for an exclusive clientele that is often foreign or a very wealthy type of tourists begging the question, is it only serving a new form of segregated consumption? Not all new pulquerias are the same, of course, and there's also many owned and run by co-ops and communities who have also been active participants of a new ethical economy. For instance, the village of San Mateo Solco that I keep mentioning, there's a very strong organization by local farmers that have teamed up with universities and specialized groups to develop new culinary products. They produce and sell locally and some even export. Some of their products include tostadas or tortilla chips made from blue and other heritage varieties of corn, corn ice cream locally produced, honey, and they work hand in hand with nearby hamlets and cities like San Andres Calpan that holds the annual Chile Nogada Festival. So this goes to say that yes, of course, the sun comes out for everyone. But that doesn't mean that we have to stop seeing things with inquisitive eyes and look for the implications of every decision we make and what's behind cultural trends. Pulque has endured the test of time, colonialism, revolutions, wars, crises, and many other transformations. It has been resignified, valued, and made relevant for new generations that benefit from this centuries old tradition. I am not sure I can or should make predictions about its future, but I think it will continue becoming increasingly popular, and I hope that its history remains a part of this new journey. As for now, I have indeed tried to provide you with more context, little known facts and a fresh perspective to appreciate pulque, the drink of the gods, divine nectar and faithful companion of many celebrations. Thank you for listening. This episode was written and produced by me, Rocío Carvajal. 
As you very well know, I am plowing my way through the swamp of thesis writing, but I'm already working on the draft of two upcoming episodes, one about carnivals across Latin America and, of course, Mexico, and another on traditional confectionery, dulceria, from Mexico. And the idea stems from the previous conversation I had with Dr. Alberto Peralta de la Garreta back in episode 68, in which we discussed the culinary legacy of um, nunneries and monasteries. So if you haven't yet listened to that episode, I very much recommend it. And I hope you have had the chance to check out the podcast crossover with Hungry Books, my other show that we resume also with an episode about the history of potatoes. But in the meantime, there is plenty of material for you to enjoy as we slowly come out of lockdowns and you can have time to listen while you take a much needed and healthy stroll in your nearest park. Remember, I'm always around on Instagram and Twitter if you want to reach out and you can always send me an email to hello at patrischipotle.com. The links to connect with me are on the notes of the show. And that's it for me, my friends, for this episode. Go out and enjoy the sunshine. Take care. Until the next time.